Good morning, B sides. Cricket, cricket. There we go. Good morning. Hi. Hello. A round of applause. Oh, oh, it works like that. All right. Pull out your wallets. Uh, it's not working. All right. So this morning we're going to talk about facing the Kobayashi Maru. This is my guide on incident response tabletops. So without further ado, let's go the right way. Me, in a nutshell. So my name's JC. I work for Snowfensive. We're a uh, local consultancy down here in South Jordan, Utah. Uh, I focus in social engineering, incident response, forensics. Uh, one of my hobbies is a maker. So if you guys see the cyber attribution dice that float around, that's me. Like a scumbag, I totally forgot to bring some to toss out to the audience. I'm sorry. Um, I'm also a former Marine. Did four years down in Pendleton as a radio operator. That was fun. Um, a lot of the Marine Corps oddities in how I present will come through. That will include me moving around and interacting with you. This will be a somewhat interactive talk. I get as much value out of it as you get. Uh, so I'll pick your brains. I'm curious what you guys do uh, while I try and impart some of my knowledge. Uh, so Snow Offensive, real quick, we focus in offensive security style assessments. So you're fishing, fishing, those things. This falls under our training uh, services. We use tabletop exercises to essentially get two things out of it. First one is training. Your staff gets more familiar with your incident response plan and procedures, and also testing. So you actually learn if you're, bless you, you actually learn if your incident response plan works or could survive the battlefield. So let's get into it. Uh, incident response tabletops. How I'm going to break it down is uh, essentially we'll talk about what a tabletop is. Uh, we'll talk about how to design a tabletop, conducting a tabletop, and then reporting. So the very first thing I want to do is clarify why I'm giving this talk. So throughout my eight years in information security, I've noticed something. And that's what I call the chupacabra effect. Yeah, this guy knows the chupacabra. Yeah. The real one. So the chupacabra is a funny story. Put your hands up if you know what the chupacabra is. Put them up high. Can't see. All right, so I'd, I'd say maybe a third of the room is raising their hands. The problem with the chupacabra is exactly that. A handful of people will state they know what it is. However, the people that raise their hands, who has actually seen one? I'm looking around the room and I'm not seeing any hands. You've seen a picture of a dead one? I've got a pretty scientific Wikipedia diagram here that someone took the time to make. That's the first oh, Sasquatch. He, they're, they're practically related. So that's the first problem that I've identified with the Jupacabra effect, is that there's, there's little to no first-hand experience. The second thing is multiple opinions on expectations. So for the people that raise your hands, if I pulled you over into a room, gave you a piece of paper, and told you to write down what it is, what you think it looks like, I guarantee that they would be all drastically different. That's a huge problem. And lastly, where is the single authoritative source on the Jupacabra? There is none. And that is the Jupacabra effect. Now, for those of you who have been around incident response, one Jupacabra that I've identified is the incident response plan. Everyone has an opinion. I've done just probably under 100 incident response plan reviews where I've taken a company's incident response plan, read over it, identified problems, strengths, weaknesses, those things. I guarantee that none of them, some of them had some common elements, but they all went crazy with some of the way they handled things. It was really weird. Tabletop exercises are a serious jupacabra in my opinion. Everyone and their mom will talk about them. But very few have conducted them. Very few have conducted them successfully. And very few know what they are. So 
before we get into it too much, who here knows what a tabletop exercise is? All right. You remember the whole analogy I just did with Chupacabra. Before we start, I said I'm going to pick on you. Okay. So, who raised their hand? Who knows what a tabletop exercise is? I'm, I'm going to go with you. you. You're loving it today. Yeah, I, it's interactive. I'm going to come up and talk. Excellent. So what the gentleman said was essentially we propose a scenario and from the scenario we introduce details and as the details are introduced we respond to it based on our incident response plan. Did I paraphrase? Describe the response. Excellent. That's a very good stab. Anyone have a different opinion? Now's the time. Ah, here we go. A different one. A lot of people don't have instant response plans. It's a very true fact, which is really fun to see them do an instant response tabletop when they've got no plan or documentation and they just kind of make it up on the fly. Any others? This is a very good point. This is what I was looking for. So on Michael's point in the back, sir, your name? Daryl. Daryl, now you're on YouTube. Say hi, Mom. Just They can only hear me. Hi, Daryl's mom. So, there is no incident response plan. We're testing all the parts of our incident response plan, and we have an expectation that logs and collections are there, but no one really knows. So, this is where we start to get into different methodologies for incident response uh, tabletops. Some schools of thought are that you go through and you say, okay, well, we're collecting Active Directory logs. Let's spend the next hour making sure all of our AD servers are producing logs. They're all getting centralized. That is a tabletop method I've seen. I've also seen a tabletop method where they actually use the time to write their incident response plan, which was an absolutely horrible idea because now the incident response plan is tailored around a phishing email, and that was it. And every once in a while I see the, what I'll call the golden child where they're actually doing it to this uh, Daryl's definition, which is correct. That's the Jupacabra. I see the Jupacabra in a lot of things. I try and do my talks around where there's very little authoritative knowledge around what things are, and that's the impetus for this talk. We've talked about what a tabletop is, so I'm not going to quiz you there, but Daryl hit the nail on the head. It is a scenario slowly presented which your team members have a chance descriptively to respond to. Does that not make sense to anyone? This is interactive. This is here for you. Does this make sense? Excellent. Any questions? All right. There's a handful of benefits to conducting a tabletop. The one which gets me a paycheck nine out of ten times is compliance. The perfect framework is the PCI. When I talk about uh, getting two birds with one stone, the tabletop exercise takes care of the testing requirement of PCI and the training requirement of PCI for your incident response plan. Compliance is a huge reason to do it. It's not the best reason but it's, it's one that gets me a paycheck. So the gentleman over here mentioned that it's, compliance is good because it helps build a cadence, and I'll completely agree. My problem with that is the PCI requires a cadence of once a year. More mature, it, it's 100% better than zero, and my, my PCI soapbox is PCI is amazing. Everybody makes fun of it, but could you imagine a world where those bare minimum requirements don't exist. There's been so many incidents that I've responded where the root finding is you don't have a firewall. They're out there. More mature organizations I see go past the compliance and they do about four a year. 
or they'll do them quarterly. The way they do it to save money is they do three internal and then a big one hosted by an external party. The next thing is to identify gaps. This is the real root and soul of why you want to do a tabletop because it's better to identify the problems in your plan, in your team members, in your technology. The gentleman over here, sorry, what's your name, Mr. Logs? Sorry? Devin. Like Devin pointed out, during an incident is the worst time to figure out that you're not collecting logs. And it's one of the most annoying things to do when you come on as part of incident response for a client. You're trying to get up to speed with the situation and you get about five minutes in and you say, okay, I'm going to need the logs for this server, this, and they cut you off and say, well, we don't keep logs. Well, good luck. Uh, I'll take off now. There's very little you can do. So identifying your gaps is one of the uh, primary points of why you want to do a tabletop. The next thing that's uh, also important is to define responsibilities. Who in the room has an incident response plan? I see a couple hands not up, which is cool if you're a student. You get that. You're unemployed. That's cool. You don't work for a company. That things are good. If you work for a company, you're on the IT team and you don't have an incident response plan, we've got problems. Of the people that raise your hands and you know you have an incident response plan, how many of them include non-technical team members, like your legal team, your HR team? How many of those people know that they're on the incident response plan? Good. There's a handful of times when I'm doing these plan reviews that a uh, company will have their HR team, their legal team, and one of the first questions I ask is, okay, you list public communications is going to do these three tasks. Who from public communications has this experience? And they look at me blankly and they say, well, we'll just hand it over to them and they'll figure it out. That's their job. During an incident is the worst time to figure out, one, you're on the incident response team, and two, how to do a breach notification. Trial by fire is cool, but it's, it's not the right way to do things. Any questions about responsibilities? This is very beneficial when you're conducting one of these tabletops. It's to get everybody in the room, look at them, and say your expectations of their role. There's been a handful of tabletops that I've conducted where the tabletop screeches to a halt. And sometimes it's fun. Other times it's just a bickering contest. But we get into who is actually going to do what, and that ain't my job argument. Another benefit, the three that I listed uh, first are kind of what I would call the primary ones. These three are your secondary ones, is to assess performance. So as we do more and more, we should start keeping metrics. How many gaps we identify? What type of issues are we coming up with? Um, as we get and I'll go into kind of the exercise maturity, but as Devin states, there's other room for questions such as what logs do we have? That's not the point of a tabletop. Uh, we'll talk about where you can actually exercise things like that, but to assess performance of your team. So here is uh, a, a notional data breach that we have. Here's the situation. Here's how much data we lost. We hand that off to a team like our legal and communications team. Let's actually see them produce uh, the breach notifications. Let's see them make the publications, the internal statements. Let's give them a random reporter calling in and requesting comment. These are things that they're probably not practicing a lot, especially if you're a much smaller or medium-sized organization. If you're an organization that has a lot of publicity time, some of these things might be second nature to them. Uh, some companies are in the news for more uh, company-related business. Uh, they might do something uh, or have access some, to some data that gets them in the news. Um, one, how would I say this example? One company was dealing with very sensitive services. Hmm. They were dealing with sensitive services. A tragedy occurred. 
when that tragedy occurred, and lots of tragedies like this occur, the media immediately bombards this company to ask questions about what you're doing, when you're doing it, who you did it for. So this company was well versed in handling uh, disasters, tragedies, uh, very big issues. So when it came to things like uh, a data breach, this was actually second nature. Their issue was more with their business. And we'll get into some of the things that we, we talked about during the tabletop, but the business decisions. So if I have an incident, where do I make the decision to stop business processes in lieu of an incident? So usually I, I get a lot of things out of the public relations team. That's usually a, uh, a place that has a lot of benefit for tabletops. But in this case, it was more of your business operations. The next thing is educate. For those of you that have raised your hand about having an incident response plan, how many of you have actually read it word by word? I didn't see as many hands, and I saw some hands that didn't raise before. So, one of the problems with an incident response plan is it's supposed to be updated often, at least yearly in many cases, usually after there's been an incident. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. When do you actually get everyone together and talk about the changes? Talk about, sir, what's your name? Talk about when Keith from IT has come over to networking. What's Keith's new role? Yeah, he had a role in the incident response plan back in IT, but now he's in networking. So how do we educate him on his new roles? How many people in your organization move to different positions? How many of them get new responsibilities? So tabletop is a great method to educate uh, our members. And lastly, synergize. You don't have to raise your hand for this one, but... Um, who here has actually been through an incident that has been pretty gnarly? The gnarly, the gnarly factor changed, huh? Handful of you. How stressful was it? Gnarly. This guy's shrugging off. Ain't no thing. Do this every weekend. Some people, it's the most stressful thing. Jobs are on the line because that guy forgot to install the firewall that we told him about, right? Others, you know, it's not too bad. But an incident is w literally one of the most stressful things that's going to, uh, aside from, I guess, downtime, depending on your company, an incident is going to be one of the most stressful things you do in an organization. This is something that could have legal ramifications, cost ramifications to your business, brand, right? Think about Target. Think about Home Depot. You have huge brand reputational damage. You have a, you have a lot of stress on the line. During an incident is not the time and place when you want to learn everybody's little eccentricities about how to work with them. When you deal with an incident, you're usually working with a large team of people, some you've never worked with before. I've seen in some incidents, you have some uh, lower level IT guys, networking guys, that are now meeting with the board. Have you guys ever seen that happen? It's the most hilarious thing to watch. It's unfortunate. But if you try and watch a low-level technical person try and explain the situation to the CEO, there's two different worlds colliding. They're talking over each other. They don't know how to interact. They don't understand the issues from one person's world to the others. We can help bridge that in the tabletop. There's a handful of times when we'll do a tabletop, I'll bring the executive team in, and the technical team, and we'll go through the full scenario top to bottom. When we do that, you get the most amazing feedback ever. It, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's like this coming to Jesus moment. I get a tear in my eye. It's, it's so much fun. What happens is, you'll, especially for budget, if you guys need budget, what will happen is they'll sit there in the beginning of the tabletop, and they'll say, okay, well, here's this scenario. Go through piece by piece. And then as we get towards the end, the C-level executives will ask questions like, how come we didn't know this? Or where are these logs? Or how do I find out this information? And you'll have that low-level technical person say, well, you didn't approve our budget to buy that syslog server that cost, what, 10 grand. And then you just see this whitewash on your CEO's face 
that we could have this huge issue compounded by the fact that we're not able to do any type of analysis because I wanted to pinch pennies. It's the most amazing thing that you'll see actually come together when you start bringing teams uh, from different worlds in on a tabletop. Now, I, I mentioned, I, I talk about this a little later on, exercise maturity. Tabletops are great, but they have a place. They're not at the beginning and they're not at the end of what I would call your testing framework. Your very first thing is planning. So this is for the guys that don't have an incident response plan that might not even have logs. You want to start planning. You want to build your incident response plan. You want to look at some of your capabilities. That's your initial, <coughs> that's your initial, uh, initial procedural documents. The next thing you want to do, and this was spot on to Devin's point, you want to do these things right before you have a tabletop. You don't want to flip them or they're not going to be effective. And that's exercises, practical exercises. You want to say, all right, let's have a scenario where we need to pull these logs. Can we do it? Let's actually do it. Please do it. Literally go do it. We, we think we can hold for a year. Go pull me a year ago, right? We think we uh, can see when uh, the geographical IP address uh, or the geographical location of an IP address from our VPN users. Go pull that data. Everything you think you can do, you should be exercising and confirming you do it. Because if not, when you get to a tabletop, this is where we get into a lot of bickering, where we'll say we can do things. And again, tabletops are very fast paced. They're notional. Like Daryl said, they're notional. So we're not actually going to have time to go in and dig out logs. There's going to be a lot of things moving on. So if you say we can get logs, I'm going to take your word for it. Tabletop isn't the place to find that. You want to figure that out before. Figure that out before, and when we get to the tabletop, you can stand up and say, well, we can't collect that. It's a huge gap. Tabletops isn't going to take you all the way either. After you conduct a few, they start losing value. They still have value maybe once a year, but where you want to move, who gets a pen test every year? A lot fewer people than have incident response plans. It's kind of fun. So, from that, many people usually get penetration tests. Why there's not many in this room, I don't know. That's interesting. One of the things you want to do is leverage your penetration test to be a testing method for your incident response plan. So what I mean by that, is, who here has heard the term purple team? Good, a lot more of you. You want to essentially conduct a purple team test. You want to make sure that you have, here's a military word for you, a liaison between your red team and your blue team. So as you're performing your penetration test, and let's say they're doing recon, and they find a box, and now they're doing a full vulnerability scan on that one box, you guys should have some tool that might be lighting up that liaison is there to look over the blue team's shoulder and say, you see anything weird with that box right there? No, you don't. Yeah, you're fired. Yeah, and that's the idea, is you want to make sure that you're leveraging a penetration test to give you more, uh, more capability specifically in testing. So you guys are getting attacked. Test your incident response team to find it to stop it, to prevent it. That's what you pay them there to do, right? That's kind of the maturity model that I've come up with for incident response plan testing. Does that make sense? Is there any questions? None? Sure. No, not for, so for an incident, right? You'll, you'll do as much as you can. That's, that's, yeah, for, for a life, if, if you really don't collect anything, we're very limited on the stuff we can do, right? No, that's fine. You, you bring up a valid point. So 
what I, what I do when I develop it, and I'll kind of show you this, is I come up with multiple information. So as, because I don't get enough time to really meet with the client, understand their infrastructure. So I come up with things that they should normally be able to get if they have common tools in their environment. So one of my favorite ones is, um, oh my gosh, drawing a blank. What's the, uh, it's like IP fix. Cisco has their own proprietary thing. What is it? It's the aggregate count of all your data. NetFlow, that's it. NetFlow, so NetFlow IP fix. That's one of my favorite ones because most people, who in here is doing full packet capture? Don't you lie to me. You got this hand that's kind of like half cocked. Ah, we're kind of doing it. It's full, it's partial packet capture, huh? Okay. Okay. Oh, so you are doing it then. So you got seven days. Excellent. So what's your name? So Brandon. Brandon's the only person in this room that's got seven days of full packet capture. Good work, Brandon. Oh wait. Two. two. You guys have it too. Excellent. So full packet capture gives you a plethora of information. However, it comes at a ridiculous cost, especially the more days you get. One of the most cost efficient things is NetFlow. It doesn't tell you as much uh, information. It really doesn't tell you much at all, but it does tell you how much data has gone from point A to point B. So it, it's a great thing from a board level perspective. If we're going through an incident and we're talking with the technical team and I say, okay, do you have guys have uh, NetFlow? or full packet capture. Like, yeah, we have NetFlow. Great, you saw eight gigs go to this IP address. Which is great because when you do an incident, you're not always gonna have all the details. You'll know that your PHI server that holds all your PHI was compromised. And now you know that eight gigs left. In a lot of cases, that's what you get in an incident. How do you respond? So, let's talk about designing. And this, this is kind of where we're going to get into the idea. Who here is a Star Trek fan? Okay, good. All the people with instant response plans. Excellent. Let, let's talk about designing a tabletop first. Let's talk about roles. When I conduct a tabletop, I have four primary roles. I have the facilitator. That's me. If you guys are doing it internally, that's whatever brave person you decided to put at the fire aid line. Because this is the person that's got to deal with making the uh, exercise flow, dealing with problem childs, and we'll get into them, coming up with information if uh, somebody throws a curveball. Then the next person you have is participants. There's a big difference between participants and observers. A lot of times you'll get into these rooms and uh, a person from the risk department wants to come in and observe which is fine. However, that person will want to interject and want to act as if I'm conducting an audit. It's the most annoying thing in the world. Participants are there and they're designed to participate. Observers are there to sit back and watch. When I build the room, I make sure if there's a, a table, a conference table, what have you, participants are at it. Observers are in the back. You're either standing against the wall you're sitting against the wall, you're out of the way, you're not at the big boy table. That's the idea. If not, for me, it's very hard to figure out who's actually a participant and who's an observer. From an internal team, it might be easier. But from an internal tabletop, it's a lot harder to tell the risk guy to shut up and stay an observer. For me, it's super easy. Uh, next thing is your scribe. When you're going through this, things are fast paced. You're essentially role playing a full incident that could take between one and three weeks in two to four, maybe eight hours. Having someone there to document and capture notes is a must. I cheat and I bring an audio recorder, which sucks because has anybody ever done transcriptionist work? Oh my God, those people can't get paid enough. Transcribing audio is the worst thing in the world. Does anyone have any questions about the roles? Awesome. Don't worry about taking pictures of my slide deck. One, it's creepy because I don't know what you're taking a picture of. Two, 
at the end, I'll put up my contact information, shoot me an email, and I'll send you the full deck. And, and that way you're not getting really bad images. Yeah, take a picture of the contact information or swing by and pick up a card, one of the two. So as I was mentioning, you have two types of facilitators. You can have an internal facilitator or an external facilitator. There's benefits to both. Uh, the first one is for an internal. They understand the company capabilities. It takes me a little bit of a learning curve as I get in and start moving to understand what you guys can and can't do. Next thing is you know where the skeletons are in the closet. You know where the weak spots are. You know what strings to pull. In some cases, it could be politically dangerous in your company to pull on those weak spots. The next thing is it's less formal. Usually having an external party come in is, uh, or not having an external party come in is something very less formal. You guys can just get together on a Friday at 5 o'clock before everyone goes home because that's when incidents happen. If you didn't know, they always happen at Friday at 5. That's when I get the call. We can, I don't know why. Stop doing it. There you go. It, it, it's right before. Well, well, you guys figured out at 4.30 and then you decide to call me at 5. I, and then the fact is you guys have been messing with this since Monday. You guys could have just called Monday and I could have helped out. Uh, and the next thing is it costs less, right? You don't have to fly me in. You don't have to bring me in. You don't have to pay for me. It's really great if you need to do these multiple times, right? If you do them quarterly, you probably want to get some internal capability. However, there's benefits to an external person like myself. One, I'm impervious to company politics. I'm the bad guy. You can't mess with me. I can piss everyone off in the room. What's going to happen? You have weak spots, I'll find them, I'll pull them. Right? That's one of the benefits is people can't hide behind their title and their rank. The next thing is um, you get an outside perspective. So how many people have worked at their company for over 10 years? Right on. 15? Yeah, 20? Eh, almost there. Almost. These gentlemen look like they're 14 years old. And they've been at their organization almost 20 years. While I applaud that, one of the problems that I see, 17? 17, 18, oh my God. Is this your first job? Yeah. You guys, nice. I hate that. <laughs> exactly, and that's the thing is, at least in my opinion, right, and we can get on a soapbox and go back and forth, when I see things like that, where it's, it's their first job, right? And I applaud you guys. I'm not, I am picking on you. I hate you guys. The, the thing is, it's like a bumblebee. You don't get to pollinate. You don't get to go see how other shops are doing it. So things like conferences, going out, networking is probably the most important thing because you, you don't get that experience that comes with job hopping every year. Like some people, are you a yearly job hopper? What? One hundred percent. I'm not telling you to quit. You guys are probably like right on the hills of retirement. So you got to get that pension. Hopefully, it's state, right? State or federal. It helps to pollinate. Bringing out, bringing in an external facilitator brings that outside perspective of that's cool. This is the way you guys have been doing it for the past twenty years. And there's a lot of shops that have people that have been there for years. One of them, they, their badges had little indicators every five years that they had been at the company, and that was like their badge of honor, right? So people got really hoity-toity if they had lots of little stickers and other people didn't have any stickers. They'd do a little dance. and it, it, Really politically stupid, but that's the benefit of having someone else come in is I can say, hey, you know, I've seen other companies in your industry do things this way it might not hurt to check it out. Turn on the travel channel, as a gentleman said. Uh, another thing is I can easily, like I mentioned, I can easily pull on the, the strings for the weak spots. There's been situations where I've conducted a tabletop. It's been a technical team. It, when you host these things, people group together. It's like the networking guys will be in the corner whispering. The IT guys will be in the corner whispering. 
they'll say something, and all of a sudden you'll see the nudge. Shut up. That's my cue to jump on them and start dating. When I see the nudge, the gloves come off. But that's one of the benefits of me is I can come in, or any external facilitator, come in and pick on those problems. Bring them to light. Let your board see them. Because it doesn't do you guys any good to hide on those things. The other thing is it's more formal. There's just something inherently formal about having an external party come in. That might be important for compliance, for the board, for investors to see things like that. A handful of you raise your hands. You guys conduct it, uh, tabletop. Pull out your wallet. Give me money. So to Daryl's point, for some reason people like to keep it a secret. So as Daryl's pointing out, one of the benefits of having an external facilitator is you guys are going to get an external report. Finding those weaknesses can move onto the report that can find funding. Sometimes I see nudges because they say they did something and they really haven't yet. So, or, or we've done it. We've said we've done it. Um, that's an excellent point. That is, that is beneficial, is having that external report. Uh, a handful of you raised your hands and said you guys conduct tabletops. Was that correct? How many of you have remote participants? How do you like it? It's fine? Excellent. So, as this gentleman says, 40% of his workforce telecommutes. That's excellent. And what I find is companies that have that telepresence capability, they've got uh, essentially remote in their blood, they can do uh, video conferences, they can do um, impromptu, some people have Skype, they join up in a Skype room, some people have Google Hangouts, what have you. It works well. A lot of organizations don't have that, yet they try and pull it off. If you're, yes sir. Yes. Right, and that's, that's where we get into my comment, kind of remote is in their blood. If you're not used to working in a remote situation, if your technical team members are remote, then you probably have a method to work with them remotely, and that's fine. My slide here is essentially when companies that don't have that remote capability, there's still a lot. It's very rare to see companies that actually believe in remote work. They'll try and bring people in remotely because Dan, the marketing guy, doesn't want to come in and he'll take it via WebEx. You can't do it like that. So my, my comment here isn't, I, I guess I should really clean up the slide a little bit. My comment really isn't, if you have a remote workforce, abandon it. No, it's don't allow people uh, to essentially participate remotely or in a method that they normally wouldn't. So if uh, I see people allow remote presence for convenience of the employee. For instance, the marketing guy doesn't want to come in or he's off-site, just schedule, change the date. If the guy's normally on-site, let him be on-site. If your technical teams are remote or your employees are mostly remote, then it's perfectly fine. It, you guys most likely have the capabilities to host those meetings and handle those communications. That's not an issue. Just don't try and have somebody just on a phone, especially if they're two doors over, which I've seen. It's the most annoying thing. When I build a tabletop exercise, I build it based on what participants are going to show up. And I have three primary methods. First one is technical. You can spend four to eight hours in a room talking about the technical aspects of an incident. You can really get into the weeds. For that reason, some exercises are specifically designed for just those technical team members. Your sysadmins, your network engineers, your help desk. 
and we work through all the intricacies of responding where we get into some of the logs and some of the analysis. Next thing is just your executives. Let's see here. Uh, just your executives. So focusing on your C-levels, right? The people that have uh, what I call an external foot in the, inter uh, in the incident response plan where they have to, uh, where they might not be involved in every incident, but for the really big ones they are. They're usually not well versed in incident response in technical situations. One of the biggest findings that I usually have from your C-levels is they want some type of weekly or monthly catch-up meeting just to understand what's going on and be kept in the loop because as we go through these things, they feel really left out. So you get a lot of value from the executive side where we talk about just responding to an incident from the business impact point of view, from the legal uh, perspective. How do we handle breach notifications? I, I talked a little bit about that earlier. And then um, the really fun one is when we mix the teams. There's two ways I mix a team. I'll do the technical first in the morning, and then I'll do the executives in the afternoon. This is more of a traditional approach for me because usually it's the technical teams that figure out we have an incident, they do some initial analysis, they work through it, and then they give the bad news at 4.30. I essentially design the scenarios to work that way. So we work through all the stuff, and then after lunch, I usually take whoever my point of contact is, and I let them brief your C-level teams. That one's a lot easier because it's more hands-off. What you have from that technical analysis from the first morning session is what you have. There's no more data. So your C levels are completely free to run through the tabletop. However, you'll get the legal stall. For those of you who have done a tabletop internally, how many of you have included your legal team? How many of you? Okay, so I got a handful of hands, like three. Out of those three, how many of you have had the legal stall where legal says, I, I need more information or we'd have to figure out more before I could answer that? Always a lot. And that's the internal politics. So I got, I got one, he's my boss, other people agree. The legal stall is, is death and they're lying. That's just what lawyers do, lie. But they do this stall technique. It's not going to benefit you. I've literally worked through all the analysis. We have all the evidence. We have all the answers to any questions. Some of the answers might be no or we don't know. Caveated with we'll never know. But what more do you need legal team? And that's what they do. They stall. When you come in and you preface your executive tabletop that we have all the answers. You'll have to make decisions. Giving them that heads up changes the game a lot. The other thing I do, and I, I mentioned this earlier, is I run the two teams simultaneously. I make sure the C-level can watch the technical, and the technical can watch the C-level. That's the whole coming to Jesus, tear in my eye, it's an amazing moment, because the C-levels can see what the technical team has to deal with, how, they're, uh, how they have their hands tied behind their back if they do, and the technical team can see the impetus for why we do things from a C-level perspective, or why we need that information. Does that make sense? One of the most important things is selecting a date. If you guys are going to do this, pick a date. I usually aim for 30 days out just because trying to get on everybody's calendars is painful. Next thing is timing. When I uh, make tabletops, I usually do it following this metric. If it's a single scenario with one team, about two hours. One scenario with a mixed team, or two scenarios with a single team, four hours. And then two scenarios with both teams, around eight hours. Logistics, when I do one of these, I have a handful of things. Uh, first one I mentioned was a conference room kind of seating. Uh, projector whiteboard, I do uh, my slides to work through these. Uh, audio recording device, that was my cheating way so I don't have to scribe things. And then snacks and drinks. 
If you've ever been through some of these, it gets annoying. People get hungry, munchies, whatnot. Try and put out some candy. For some reason, candy puts a little bit more sugar in people's blood. They get a little bit more responsive. And then they crash and die. So the whole point of this talk, the Kobayashi Maru. So where's my Star Trek fans at? Excellent. Daryl, what is the Kobayashi Maru? The unwinnable exercise. That is how I de uh, design all of my tabletops, as an unwinnable exercise. Who thinks that's fair? Yeah. <laughs> One big, big smile and hand goes up. Right here, it's perfectly fair. There's a, there's a reason. Well, it's not fair to Kirk, right? That was the whole point. The idea behind it is if we get 15, 30 minutes, an hour into a tabletop, and I let you guys win. All right, yeah, that's in the logs. Okay, you found it. You shut it down. Great. What value is that going to give you? As a quote from one of my former clients, these guys literally said, "Walked up, you're a mean man. <laughs> they literally called me a mean man. And the reason is because I bring hell, fire, and brimstone. I bring it all. At the end of every tabletop, you have lost all of your data. You, you've... Uh, been reduced in terms of brand identity. Worse than Target, worse than Home Depot. That's the whole idea. If I don't drive essentially to the biggest data breach you guys could have as a company, I'm not going to be able to focus on every bit of your instant response plan. So the whole point of the Kobayashi Maru is I'm going to design this to failure to figure out how you guys fail. Figure out where all your vulnerable spots are. And that's, that's the idea. When I do it, I essentially start with some type of real-world attack. What, um, what's going on in the news? What's famous? Then I add some practicality. That's where I uh, essentially map it to your industry. And then lastly, I top it with risk. Are you guys a PCI shop? Are you guys a HIPAA shop? Guess what data is going out the window? Uh, I mentioned that I use a slide deck. So essentially, like Daryl mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, nail on, uh, um, when I do this, I essentially take that scenario that uh, Daryl mentioned and I slice it up into little details and I slowly present that out. One of my best scenarios is a lost laptop. Out of the people that do tabletops, who does, who has like their best scenario that worked really well? No one? Who here has done a lost laptop? Excellent. Lost laptop is the best because you can start from something so weak to, again, the biggest data breach of your company. So I usually start with a uh, laptop on a Friday, employee going home, had it jacked out of his car, but because he's a scumbag employee and doesn't do we uh, work on the weekends, he never noticed. Monday comes around, he's looking for his laptop, can't find it, checks his office, calls his wife, still can't find it, uh-oh, can't find it. All right, about noon, I'll report it. What happened over the weekend? Well, it got stolen. It got stolen. Now, this is where you start dealing with the people. Because they'll say, well, we have usernames and passwords, right? Right? Well, this guy isn't the best employee. He tapes his username and password. Right? Or we have two-factor. Guess what was in his laptop bag? His token. So as you do analysis, you find out the attacker connected over the weekend. They've been in the uh, network. They've siphoned data. It's a great low-risk to end-of-the-world scenario. Conducting tabletops, conducting what I've given tabletop training a handful of times to organizations to help them offer this as a capability. This is the heart and soul of it. When you conduct it, you're essentially playing Dungeons and Dragons. You have a handful of things. You've got player knowledge versus character knowledge. Who, where's my D&D fans? Excellent, right? So you know what I'm talking about. We're all in the room. It's usually not always the case, right? So you have to take into account that this might start off with IT, 
We're 10 minutes into the incident. Legal, please don't comment yet. You have to let the scenario grow a little bit. Let them uh, show that they're involving legal. One of the reasons I do that is because part of your incident response plan is communication procedures. How do you bring in people? How do you notify? So I try and test that early and then just consider everybody in scope. Uh, you provide information as needed. You change the scenario as needed. As people are clever, when I get in a room with some of the company's most clever people, they're going to throw curveballs at me. I have to be able to adapt. Um, one of the other things is making sure people participate, getting in their face, making sure people answer. Like I said, one of the benefits is testing and training. So making sure your uh, participants are engaged. And general harassment. I, I didn't get the title for a mean guy for no reason. You gotta make sure the stress is there, the issues are there, the realism is there. Avoid groupthink. This is one of the biggest problems. As the tabletop goes on, people will just start to mass together and say, yeah, that's a good idea, let's go this way. Or a uh, gentleman over here mentioned that guy's my boss, you usually don't disagree or recommend other methods from that of your boss. What I try and do is make sure that if I see that twinkle in the eye, like somebody's got an idea that's a little different, make sure to call on them, figure out what he or she wants to do, how they want to drive, and make sure that idea has a stage to be presented. The problem child. For those of you that have conducted your tabletops, have you guys ever had a problem child? It's usually the networking guy. I don't know why. No, it's the networking guy. It's not operating the networking guy right here. The problem child, there's almost at least one. There's always one in a tabletop. This is the person that's going to sit there and poke holes in the scenario and say, oh, that can't happen. Oh, we've got this. Or no way. It's usually the networking guys. I like picking on them. Sometimes, sometimes, but there is always a problem child, I can guarantee it. I don't know who it's going to be for you, but there will be a problem child. There will be someone that tries to shut you down. The second you identify who that problem child is, you have to do your damnedest to shut them down as fast as you can. Come up with some, and this is why you have to be quick on your feet, come up with some alternative. When I did the lost laptop once, they said, oh, well, there's no way he could have had his username and password taped on. It's like, yeah, yeah, there is. And they, they worked with me. Um, some of them brought up, um, oh, we, uh, we have full disk encryption. It's like, that's great. And the username and password is taped on it. It's happened, right? So you, you have to just keep fighting and, and really get them to stop. You have to make an example. You have to stand up to them. If you don't, because this happened on the first one, if you don't, they will steamroll your exercise and reduce it to nothing. Question. It is Captain Kirk. You've got to watch out for Kirk. You've got to watch out for the Kirks. So, after action summary, at the end of the tabletop, I do a quick uh, debrief. I make sure everybody, this is where I do allow the observers to uh, talk and to contribute. I try and figure out what went wrong, what went well. Uh, what other gaps? This is big because somebody might be sitting on something or we moved past it and we didn't get a chance to talk about it. Next thing is reporting. Handful of ways to report. The easiest thing to do is a T-chart. Here's your strengths, here's your weaknesses. Next thing you can get a little bit more crafty with is some type of SWOT analysis. Who here is not familiar with the SWOT analysis? Handful of you. Guess what? Google's your friend. I've got five minutes left. It's essentially a, uh, a, a matrix of your strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, that when you hash it out, looks a little something like this, where your strengths and opportunities map to your natural priorities, your threats and strengths map to some easy defenses, and uh, so forth. Now, with five minutes left, I'm going to impart on you the most important adage from the Marine Corps. And that's, you fight how you train, and you train how you fight. And it sounds a whole lot simpler than what this guy was saying, so we changed it up a little bit. 
essentially when you get into a tabletop, you work through it. How you responded then is exactly how you're going to respond when an actual incident happens. When I leave, and that's my final words for that group, there's just this huge wave of realism that either we're rock solid or holy crap, we're screwed. This is, again, not the only way to prepare for an incident, but it is one of the better ways. And it's a method in which you can figure out where your gaps are before an actual incident happens. So with that, as I mentioned, uh, we've got five minutes left. I can ask, answer some quick questions. Here's the final slide that you actually do want to take a picture of or come up to me and grab a card. Shoot me an email. I'll send you the slide deck. Um, I think that's it. So questions, comments, concerns, saved rounds, alibis. How, so the question was, how real do I make them? Whenever possible, I'd be as descriptive as I can. Because you could say, oh, a laptop. And we've done that, right? We've had some organizations, well, we don't want to name names. But when you say a laptop, right. But when I actually say, oh, Jim, the account executive for the Western region, everybody all of a sudden gets a sullen look because they know exactly what Jim has on his laptop. So whenever practical and available, I make sure to use as much description as possible. Even if it means pointing the finger, it's worth it. Because then we don't have to play this game of, okay, well, it's also got this data and it's got that. Everyone knows what Jim has. So the question was, so the question was on this scenario, which laptop would you pick? The, the one with not as much juicy details or the one with as much juicy details, right? Did I get that right? We'll think Kobayashi Maru, right? What's going to destroy the company at the end of the day? Jim with all the customer information and the largest accounts on his laptop. Sorry, Jim. Question. No, this 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 is an excellent comment. So, so the gentleman brings up a really good point. One of the difficult parts in some of his tabletops he's mentioning is when does a customer go from an event to an incident? Half of the customers I work with don't actually have a definition. That's its own finding right there. The way I do it is I essentially just keep compounding the problems and through every stage until we've made that determination, I'm asking, so have we declared an incident? And as I got to the communication lines, and this is the last question, we can chat afterwards. Um, I'll ask, okay, is this an incident? No, we're still in IT, we're still analyzing. Here's more information. Is it an incident yet? No, we're still analyzing. Okay, well, here's some more information. Oh, it is an incident. Okay, now I expect you guys to follow your communications and involve other parties. So with that, hopefully, I think we just had more of a discussion than a question. Um, that's all I have. I'll be around the back. I got to clean up for the next speaker. Uh, we can chat more. Thank you, everyone, for your time. This has been fun. Thanks for being engaging.